and gentlemen, welcome to the last day of the Martin Roth Symposium 2020 here in wonderful Berlin, beautiful Berlin, here in the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin. Presented by IFA, the Institute for Auslandsbeziehungen, in cooperation with Republika, this second Martin Roth Symposium 2020 takes place as a digital theme week from 7th to 11th September 2020, here in the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin, funded also by the German Federal Foreign Office. So thanks for the organizing partners. The symposium, as you all know, aims to bring together thought leaders from the political, the artistic, the academic, and of course, the economic and the cultural sectors to share ideas and their scenarios and their visions for the future forward about museums and future. And today, this is beautiful to see, we meet in person for a hybrid analog event with you in the live stream, but of course, with the participants here in the audience. Thank you very much for being here. Give ourselves a big round of applause for starting into our live stream of today. And welcome also for tuning in today here in the live stream. We're going to dive into our topic of today. We had lots of topics in the past week. Today, we discuss about museums and failure. But we're going to discuss this not as an oxymoron, but rather as a necessity. So. Failure, as we know, has, um, yeah, has a value for self-reflection, also gives this push and this energy for innovation. But we ask ourselves today, what does failure mean in the world of museums and, of course, for the museum sector? Where is the space, actually, where we can talk about our mistakes, our pitfalls, and where can we reflect upon wrong decisions in a culture that so often emphasizes just the impact stories, the good news, and, of course, the success stories? How and where can we learn from negative experiences and from disappointments we all made on the, on the way forward, right? So, how do we take responsibility for our mistakes? How can we share our experience of knowledge about the lessons learned? And the question is also, do we need a new spirit? Do we need a new spirit, maybe a more entrepreneurial culture that exactly embraces this failure? what conditions and values are needed in museums for a productive learning processes, for an open exchange, and of course, for a dynamic, self-reflective cultures. Speakers today will present their thoughts on the topic and the questions, of course, in sprint sessions, which are 10-minute inputs. And following the sprints, we are going to have deep dives. I know you already know and you're familiar with that format. Deep dive is a deep exchange between you the audience and you, the participants in the live stream. So please share your questions, raise a hand here in the venue hall if you have a question, and share your questions in the live stream. Just tap the button, dabei sein, taking part on campus.republica.com to get it right with the website. So this was a little outline for today. I'm very excited to see so many beautiful smiles without a mask. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining in and dialing in today. Please welcome now for the welcoming words on stage with a big round of applause again, Ulrich Rauf, the president of the Institute für Auslandsbeziehungen. Welcome. And also with us, Dr. Sarah Darwin from the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin. Welcome. Ms. Koch from Republika cannot be with us tonight, unfortunately, just to mention that, but we're going to start with the welcoming words. Mr. Rolf, the world is yours. Thank you, Katie. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the fifth day of the Martin Roth Symposium. Unlike the four previous sessions, this one, this last one, will allow us at least a bit of old-fashioned real presence. But Martin, Martin wrote, I'm sure, would have enjoyed the way we discussed these days across continents, oceans, and time zones. Our topics were mainly still identical with his agenda. He considered the museum as a public space, an agora an open space that he defined in a radically democratic way. As a group of friends, or a band of friends, of Martin, the IFA, that is the Institute for Foreign Relations, we feel 
deeply committed to Martin's ideas and ideals. That is why we created the Martin Roth Symposium as an open forum for the discussion of themes and topics at the intersection of culture and politics. As a general subject for this year's Martin Roth Symposium too, we have chosen one of the most intriguing questions in this field, the future of museums. In the three years since Martin passed away, new political and social challenges have arisen. I mention only the most visible ones, the pandemic crisis we are going through and the fights for political freedom and social justice we are witnessing from Portland to Hong Kong. Only 400 meters from here, Alexei Navalny is fighting the effects of a poison attack on his life undertaken in his country, his home country, Russia. And only 500 meters from here, you have the German government still struggling for a political answer to this political crime. Whatever the outcome of this crisis will be, it might deeply affect our cultural relations with Russia too. These challenges and the answers given repeatedly during this conference, I call them the big three Ds for digitizing, digitizing, decolonization, sorry, <laughs> and diversity do in fact concern the body and soul of the museum as well as its practical operations. In their consequence, they may give the long history of the museum a new and unexpected twist. They will confront us and the old, if not ancient, institution we're talking about with new chances to do things right and new chances of making mistakes and finally of failure. One of the greatest and some may say craziest artists, European artists of my generation, or the generation before, the Belgian concept artist and situationist Marcel Brothaas has foreseen this situation when he posted the following offer. I have a postcard of his offer, which says, Musée à vendre pour cause de faillite. Museum to sell for cause of failure. I'm sorry to say I missed the opportunity to buy me a, a personal museum. Before I lay down the microphone, let me conclude with some sentences that all begin with the words, thank you. The Martin Road Symposium would not have been possible without you. First, thank you to Harriet Road and to the advisory board for your ideas and your commitment. Thank you to the Foreign Office, to Republica, and to the National Museum. And thank you, last not least, to my colleagues and to the entire IFA team. And thank you, the audience, for your kind attention. Thank you, Mr. Raul. Dr. Sarah Darwin. It's my enormous pleasure to welcome uh, everybody, the live stream and everybody here, a live audience. This is something I haven't experienced for uh, several months. So a very, very big warm welcome to the Museum of Naturkunde Berlin. I'm gonna talk very, very briefly about Charles Darwin in relation 
to failure. Charles Darwin, of course, is most famous for his success in his theory of evolution by natural selection. This theory involves both success and failure. And as Darwin wrote, extinction and natural selection go hand in hand. Extinction is the ultimate failure and, of course, is irreversible. But as one of Charles Darwin's great-great-grandchildren, I'm interested in his emotional journey as well as his intellectual journey. And here I would argue that failure played a massive role in his development as a person. The young Charles Darwin was regarded by his father as a failure. Charles Darwin didn't reach his potential at school, and he was taken out and sent to medical school at 16. He dropped out of medicine. After two years, he couldn't cope with the blood and gore, and he then was sent to Cambridge to study to be a clergyman. He completed the course, but not wanting to become a vicar. His father complained in a letter, you care for nothing but dogs, shooting, rat catching, and you will be a disgrace to yourself and to your whole family. Darwin was then given an opportunity to join a voyage that would travel around the world, and this would allow him to be the naturalist and pursue his love and passion for nature. I would suggest it was his fear of failure that encouraged him to work hard observing and collecting specimens for that five years. He found fossil remains of a giant extinct sloth in Argentina, and he found birds in the Galapagos Islands and observed how the shapes of the birds and the beaks were adapted to their environment. But he spent 20 years after he returned to the UK writing his theory up. And I would say that it was his fear of failure that actually made this theory a success. He spent 20 long years thinking about all of the arguments that people might have against his theory. He wrote to people around the world, I gather around four letters a day. He contacted naturalists. He wanted answers to all of the questions that he could think of. And that was a fear of failure, I would argue. And his success was, in fact, that he waited all this time, collected the evidence, and then finally published his book, which, of course, was a massive success. It sold out on the day of publication. Later in life, Darwin lamented that he had failed by not doing more for his fellow creatures, the plants and animals that inhabit our planet. This is a legacy that's very close to my heart. And failure of our generation to prevent mass extinction of species and habitat destruction would be absolutely unacceptable. Today, we must protect nature and democracy. And with that, I would like to welcome you all, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing your talks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah Darwin and Ulrich Rauf. Thank you. And uh, now we kick off the program with our first sprint of the day. Museums and art institutions, as you all know, are ch challenged by several factors and crises. For example, environmental crisis, or economic crisis, or by social crisis. So our first sprint will be about this. The title is it, In Search of a Radical New Model, Museum Assemblage. And our speaker is Margot Jatta Ludwigiak. I hopefully pronounce it correctly. She's an independent art critic and curator. Welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hello. I'm, it's my pleasure to, and honor to be here. 
Um, thank you very much, uh, IFA and uh, the whole IFA team, especially Dr. Kilia Lada and all the organizers for, for the, this kind of invitation. Speaking about museum futures um, seems crucial nowadays, and this question was also very close to my institutional practice during last year uh, when I was a uh, director of Center of Contemporary Art in Warsaw, Poland. I will speak about an urgent need to radically rethink museums and art institutions and propose a model of museum assemblage as a possible solution and a point of departure towards new museum subjectivity. I would like to make first several points, three points. Um, firstly, to, to, say that, uh, to state that the museum model as we used to know, um, as we used to experience it for the last two decades or more, is not going to survive faced with accelerating global crisis. And of course, I'm not talking only about the pandemic crisis, which is uh, rather a kind of accelerator itself to, to see processes like through the magnifying lens that we have been experiencing since a long time now. Um, I think that not only museums will face very soon problems with their physical survivor, for example, a recent survey by American Alliance of Museum, uh, Museums shows that the US will soon, or might soon, lose one-third of all museums due to fundraising um, sources and financial reserves running dry. But also, um, I think that they won't simply stay relevant if they don't change on the ontological level, if they won't change their ontological status. Secondly, not only have museums to, have to, to face challenges brought by global crisis, be that economic, environmental, social and political, like the rise of far right wing populist uh, regimes or uh, also recently the BLM movement. But um, basically, they have to recognize and admit that they are themselves uh, a part of the problem. Uh, and, uh, and they are also actively contributing to the crisis. Uh, like, for example, by participating in the neoliberal system, flows of capital, be that um, symbolic or real, participating in lodging of production, uh, fever, fever of effectiveness, producing shows, uh, traveling exhibitions, um, artworks, publication, rising the number of, of visitors, which is so many times imposed on us museum professionals by, um, uh, by organizers of museums. Uh, then also, uh, museums are creating a huge carbon footprint. Uh, uh, they are stuck, in a way, in a trap of mobility, and they have been stuck there since years. I have an impression of exchange, traveling. Um, they are a part of the system to an extent of uh, global uh, biennialization, production of, of traveling shows. But also on the, on the social and political level, in, in this context muse of museums functioning, um, there is a, a huge failure. They are, and I, I, I think that it might be the, the biggest, maybe, or the most painful failure that the museums are experiencing. Uh, and to, um, to elaborate a little bit on this, I'd like to quote um, Yesomi Umolu. She's a director of um, the Logan Center Exhibitions of University of Chicago, and she published recently a text on Artnet under a title On the Limits of Care and Knowledge. 
And um, she places museums within colonial past with its impulse to, to collect and with its violence. And, and she makes a quite a sharp and, and strong point saying that, quote, exclusionary spaces uh, for the privileged, this is what, how she sees museums, are built for the betterment of Western subject and society at the expense of the other. And museums, they are, she, uh, she claims, she continues, detached from the society while presuming themselves to be at the service of civic society. So um, uh, when we uh, like take her point of view, it's much easier to understand uh, the processes of othering that museums are, are producing, have consciously... Um, contributing to them and to the processes of exotiza exotization and, uh, and monetizing the difference at the end. And, um, and the elitist position of uh, museums, which might sound uh, surprising because uh, museums in general, uh, many years ago, they, they took on the conscious level this uh, position of, um, of being uh, critical, socially engaged, open, um, and uh, this is what they declare. This is what we declare. And, but on the other hand, if we recognize the elitist position of uh, museums, so it's much easier to understand the huge backlash of populist uh, regimes against museums, especially against museums of, of contemporary and modern art, and the discourse um, of these regimes that they want to take these institutions or museums back. And this is the discourse that, for example, I, I know myself very well from my experience from Poland. So, um, so museums uh, uh, definition and, and model, um, how it looks like today. I, I don't want to quote um, the, the ICOM definition. It, it seems to be quite obvious, but it we um, uh, have a look at museum definition and model, which we know not only since last two decades, uh, but since 19th century, it's very much object-centered, collection of objects-centered, and stable. And from this uh, stabilized um, distance, museums take their critical position. So um, my last, like, question and, and remark for, for their um, discussion would be um, how to stay relevant. Not what museums should do to cope with the crisis, to respond to the challenges, uh, to produce less carbon footprint, but how they should change their ontological status. And the ontological change, it implies maybe not one new model of museum, but uh, myriads of models, and they seem to be contained or somehow related to a notion of institution assemblage. Uh, and the institutional assemblage, which is uh, which we can imagine as, uh, for example, museum bar, museum community, museum residence, museum environment, uh, museum that is leaving a um, safe, stabilizing position of critical distance and extending it to involvement, a museum which which engages with the world generates encounters of people, objects, bodies, plants, and territories, uh, becoming museum on the move, uh, museum with porous borders or confused boundaries. Um, and my last remark um, would be how, uh, how to um, get to this, um, um, to this point of departure, actually. Um, so, I think that leaving or exceeding, exceeding the logic of production would be the precondition and uh, the, the, the condition sine qua non uh, to, to start this process of changing. Uh, exceeding the, the logic of production by slowing down, downsizing, turning to maybe process-oriented practices instead of art-object-oriented processes, which at the end lead many times to commodification of artworks, 
Uh, be performative, build relationships, be hospitable, learn from the outside world, and be Museum Assemblage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margarita Ludwigiak. Thank you very much for this first sprint. We are heading into our second sprint with the question, what does it mean to be an artist? Our speaker of the next sprint will talk about it. Believe in momentum, fighting fear of failure. She is a TV producer and a filmmaker. Lucy Darwin is with us. Welcome. Hello, and thank you for having me. Um, this is necessarily going to be a bit different from the previous speaker, but thank you for all of your interesting thoughts. Um, so, almost 20 years ago, on a snowy February morning, I was here in Berlin for the world premiere of uh, my first film, Lost in La Mancha, a documentary about the film director Terry Gilliam, who was failing to make his film about Don Quixote. Uh, I had been rejected by the panorama section. The selectors um, didn't want the film, but thankfully Dieter Koslick uh, chose to support me. I didn't have enough money to finish the film, let alone to ship it, so here I had to, carry, I had to hand carry two metal cans between them, weighing 30 kilos on the plane. The film showed to the press, and I watched from the side of the theater as they laughed and they covered their faces in horror and they dried their eyes. But by the evening of that day, the festival had to program an extra screening because word had got round. One person came to us afterwards and asked if he could start a web, crowding, web crowd funding campaign for Terry. Long before this was fashionable or even a working option on the internet, this was very early in the internet days, his failure therefore inspired much support and loyalty, but over the years, no single person or institution gave him entirely what he needed to make his passion project. For some people, failure or even just the fear of failure can be a reason for inertia to set in. It's much easier to do nothing, right? For others, it's what motivates and drives them on to keep them scaling their personal Everests. It can be extremely messy, complex, and a painful process, but it's also the absolute reality for those who are driven to create. Sustaining the necessary blind faith to make a film is exhausting and debilitating. Believe me, I know. I'm proposing if we want our arts and culture to thrive, we need to be less, less risk-averse. I'll talk about two directors I know very well, Woody Allen and Terry Gilliam, who has been our documentary subject for 25 years. Since 2002, our tiny, low-budget documentary has become an award-winning cult classic. It's considered one of the best films about filmmaking and is taught in schools and universities all over the world. Not just for those studying film, but in a wider context such as business, where learning about failure is taught as an integral component of success. By the way, the irony of making a film, a highly successful one, about one which fails spectacularly is not lost on me. Fast forward, and I've recently finished producing a follow-up film. It's called He Dreams of Giants. And it's um, after about nine failed attempts, Terry Gilliam finally made his movie. The new film is a deeply personal insight into what it means to create art in the face of financial and artistic compromise. To make a film, one needs not just passion, but considerable money, and almost no filmmakers have the kind of money required to finance their own films. Producers like myself are there to enable that process and seek the finance. But films are risky. Failure is either creatively or financially, or both, extremely likely, because so many different elements are at play. Moving parts, can we cast the actors we really want, hire the best creative contributors, source all the best locations, and having got all of that enormous jigsaw in place, we have to contend with the health of those key individuals, with uh, potentially catastrophic weather. All of these issues are shown in their glory in both documentaries. An outsider gets to see exactly how hard it is to make a film, and indeed how to fail to make one. 
My argument is that making films is hard enough that we should be enabling our best creative minds to go through their work with the least possible obstacles and not the reverse, which is the case for so many. Gilliam has pressed ahead like a shark that would die if it stopped swimming. He never gave up in the face of repeated failure. His task was Sisyphean, and his ambition never waned. He went ahead without what he really needed. The money wasn't all there. Creative limits had been placed on him. To quote Amy Gilliam, his daughter and producer, the truth is no, there's never been enough money. People might read this script, but people don't read it with Cherry's eyes. I, for one, want to see all of his genius imagination on the screen. What happens when you have an early career failure? Gilliam's The Adventures of Baron Munchausen was a commercial failure, and this fact unfairly dogged him throughout his career, despite having subsequently gone on to make several critical and commercial hits. Everyone should know those losses were largely the responsibility of his producer, but they prefer to blame Gilliam because it's easier. A film director's journey, as with any artist, is a continuum, and successes are built on both the positive outcomes and failures of previous projects. There is little consistency of outcome as the challenges of the jigsaw are different on every film. Despite all the research and analysis, very often the successes are the ones that surprise and fly in the face of what's expected. The producers of My Big Fat Greek Wedding which remains one of the most successful films of all time, were turned down by every distributor, who in, who in effect, they preordained its failure. Call it karma, but it's often down to the sheer bloody-mindedness of the individuals pushing through their unlikely projects. It still makes my heart sing <laughs> that those producers funded the film's release themselves and then reaped the rewards. Hundreds of millions of dollars of profit. In Related Karma, I've kept the emails from executives who said that Lost in La Mancha wasn't worth making and would fail. <sighs> Film executives make decisions using financial models like all modeling is imperfect. They also make these choices anticipating what the audience wants, attempting to be arbiters of public taste. But actually, you can never predict the audience's taste as it's in a continual state of inquiry. Precious few filmmakers are in the position where they have enough control to be given a budget and allowed to proceed without such interference. When I was raising the money for our newest film, I looked at the application for funding from the British Film Institute. By the way, I recognize that state support is wildly different um, depending on where you are in Europe, but pl please bear with me, there's a point here. I read through this enormous and demanding form, and at the end I found that I would need to have a highly detailed treatment of the project approved by those executives, give up a percentage of the copyright of the film, and give those same executives editorial approval in exchange for funds. This cannot be right. We need to give support with philanthropic generosity and allow the risk of mistakes and failure. This allows the chance of success or failure to be in the hands of the makers where, in fact, the responsibility lies. At the moment, we have a culture where others determine the parameters of art so as to minimize the chance of failure. We quite often have scripts written by committee. I don't think this is healthy. In Woody Allen's new memoir, Apropos of Nothing, he says, failure comes with the territory. If you're afraid of, afraid of failure or can't handle it when it happens, and if you're not playing it safe as an artist, it will surely happen now and then. You must find another way to make a living. So the bottom line is failure comes with the territory of making art. All art and cultural institutions are not immune. But we need to provide the opportunity, indeed, to fund those with the vision to take artistic risks and fail along the way if that's the outcome, because it's part of the journey. During the years 1992 to 2006, I worked with Woody Allen, and he made 16 films. For each of those films, he had total creative control. He offered me the chance to be one of the producers of Matchpoint. When I was raising the money, potential financiers had to know that they might not make a profit, although the chances were that they would eventually make their money back. Under no circumstances did they get to see a script, although they did have a couple of lines about the story. They would not know who was being cast or any of the key creative positions or have any part in either the production or the editing. My line was, given the money in a paper bag, 
and he'll deliver you a film. Now, some of those films were failures, either commercially or artistically, and Woody is the first to admit that. But in there are a few gems, including Matchpoint, I'm proud to say, one of his most commercially successful films. When he was still editing, he told me I was lucky. It's a good one, he said. We were in the car on the way to another premiere. The important thing here is that Woody Allen was allowed to make his art fully funded without interference from anyone, and I think that Terry Gilliam and others should have that same freedom to create. The dictionary defines failure as the opposite of success, but really success is a moment in time. And to have success, it's necessary to fail a great deal in the process. If you're too scared of failure, you'll never try to achieve anything. So by extension, is Gilliam fearless? Not true. Our film shows painfully how much fear he battles to do his work. He said in an interview, it's all about maintaining my belief that I'll be able to finish it. Once it goes, then you're just holding on, trying to get enough sleep every night. It's about fooling yourself into thinking you can do it, and that's all. And that's where most of my energy is, just in trying to fool myself to believe in something that is possible. The part that scares me is that people have been imagining it, and it may not live up to their imagination. Passionate, confident, determined leadership at the top, and enough funding to employ the creative supporting teams below. Does that resonate in the museum world? Films only get made because a handful of individuals believe and push forward projects with unchecked optimism. The vast majority of finished films are genuine failures. Objectively speaking, even if they manage the feat of getting distributed, they can and do fail to connect with critics and audiences. Commercially, they are not a good bet, as in 80% of cases, films fail to get released, let alone repay their investors. The risks are enormous, and particularly for those of us who work independently, but we do it practically, for the love of the medium, for storytelling, Speci specifically with regards to documentaries, the love of preserving particular stories and histories for future generations. Many of today's veteran directors will all say that they learn their craft by being allowed to experiment. I fear for the next generation of young film directors as so much of that has been eroded. I also fear for the future of independent films when all parts of the industry are now so commercially driven, it's unacceptable indeed any chance of risk is entirely avoided. This has always been the way, but margins are ever shrinking and increasingly precious few distributors and exhibitors are willing to support smaller films. They are also under pressure from increasingly powerful streamers who are circumspect when it comes to films that don't fit their commercial brief. We need, more, we need a more philanthropic attitude in the film world and a cultural shift to allow more exp experimentation and divergence. Please let those with vision and imagination fly with their ideas. And remember, Thomas Edison did a thousand experiments, and a thousand and one was the light bulb. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy Darwin. Thank you very much. Thank you. Coming to our next sprint, sprint number three. As failures are part of any cultural work, whether intended or not, she will go with us into it. The director of the Linden Museum in Stuttgart, Staatliches Museum für Völkerkunde, is with us, Ines de Castro, and she will talk about the museum as failure. Yes, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much uh, for the possibility of speaking here and of really learning for, uh, from all these discussions. I would like to talk about museum as failure. Failure, for me, it is a very unusual topic, and I must say that I was a little surprised at first when I was asked uh, to talk about it. But it is surely important to address. Also, failure is part of everyday life, and I th also think an integral part of any cultural work. We rarely share or discuss failure related to the museum work. My impression is that in the museum sector, the focus lies clearly on the successes achieved, hiding or avoiding experienced failure. Why is this? With over 6,000 museums in Germany, I can imagine that one reason is a certain competition in the museum area. 
Museums seem to compete with each other in the favor of the public as well as in the favor of stakeholders and sponsors who often tend to regard the numbers of visitors as the only measurement of, much of museum success. Additionally, expectations and tasks for the museums grow steadily. This, be, be, uh, this may be one reason why it is so difficult to share one's mistakes with stakeholders, colleagues, or the public without fearing negative consequences in a society oriented towards growth and success. Apart from private contexts, I also miss a safe place where failures could be discussed and where negative experiences could be shared. This development is regrettable because the self-critical internal and external reflection on failure could, in my opinion, serve as an additional motor for innovative path or for fruitful change processes in museums. And museums with state sponsorship, as the Linden Museum, which are finally secured at least for their basic task, could be more open towards failure since they can afford failure without getting into existential hardship, at least for some extent. The current crisis shows us how lucky we are in the state sponsorship in a very unsure environmental um, uh, uh, time for the cultural sector. But talking about museums and failure, one also could ask if the construction of the museum itself cannot be generally interpreted as failure. At least with regard to the invention of the ethnographic museums in the 19th century, this is certainly true seen from today's perspective. Ethnographic museums were created from purely European, colonial, and evolutionary thought, collecting non-European art as well as daily life objects and separating them from similar European collections in other museums, mostly with the exception of old civilizations considered to be of higher rank in Marx, as for example the old Egyptian collections that were not incorporated into ethnographic museums. Ethnographic museums were established to present the foreign as opposed to the European own. For a long time, they have thus legitimized the assumed dominance of Europe as part of identity and legitimized the hierarchical view on the different cultures of the world. Even if, unfortunately, some of these approaches are still anchored in the thinking of our society of today, one could ask if an ethnological museum still has a justification for our modern society, characterized by diversity and globalization. Can this constructional failure with an emphasis on non-European be overcome? And how can it be done with the existing collections? And in general terms, can museums overcome the original meaning and message and develop to something totally different. We have been working on these questions for several years in a very critical way at the Linden Museum Stuttgart, especially in a project founded by the Bundeskulturstiftung and with the financial support of the state of Baden-Württemberg. With regard to a new building that we envision around 2030, we started internal workshops, cooperation projects, as well as an important public conference with national and international guests to discuss a new form of ethnological or ethnographic museum for Stuttgart, experimenting with new ways of participation and presentation in close cooperation with numerous representatives of indigenous societies, international colleagues and artists, as well as with representatives of the diverse Stuttgart city society. At the Linden Museum, the curators look back on a long-lasting experience in participatory projects and exhibitions. Like some other ethnographic museums, we are undergoing a process of transformation with the task to renegotiate the role and the social relevance of the museum, developing and testing new forms of museum knowledge production, mediation, and presentation. 
We envision a museum that deals critically with its colonial roots, a museum that is aware of its social responsibility. In November, we will show a work in process exhibition on the often unspoken or perhaps unknown colonial traces of the museum and of Stuttgart and Württemberg, hoping to bring this discourse into schools and society. We envision a museum as a place of critical dialogue, polyphony, and many subjective stories. We also discuss how to address more current and socially relevant topics responding to social changes within a manageable time horizon. You have to know that the average preparation time of our exhibitions is around two years. It's not so easy. To overcome the dichotomy between us in Europe and they abroad, we think that an integration of historical and modern local Swedish objects of the Landesmuseum Württemberg into the new museum conception is crucial. To get over this assumed historical hierarchy of cultures, trying to establish a new vision on the global south and perhaps on the world. We still have a long and difficult way to go. We are just starting. But it is good that we have the time for the self-reflection process before starting a new exhibition concept for the new building. Problematic is for sure the fact um, that this change process takes place beside the current projects and exhibitions of the museum. That is not an easy task for our staff. There are so many questions that we have started to address to overcome old museum patterns. Who speaks in the museum? How can we avoid ethnic attributions and stereotypes? What stories should be told? What is the future role of the museum, of the curators and the collections? How can we improve long-lasting corporations with indigenous societies or international and local partners? To what extent can we fulfill their, their requirements regarding handling, exhibition, or interpretation of objects, online, uh, for example, or online, online publishing of historical documents? We are asking here, to whom do the objects belong in a moral sense? And how can we guarantee that corporations are fruitful for both parties and that the museum is not only taking advantage of outside knowledge? How can we establish more flexibility in our permanent exhibitions? How do we relate collections of the 19th century with actual topics? You see, the list of questions is very large. On this way, we will certainly make a lot of mistakes, and we will hopefully learn from them, as well as from the experiences and high expertise of our several cooperation partners. We should also take into consideration that an overcoming of historical museum patterns cannot be achieved by a content-related reconception alone. Structural changes must also be discussed with our politicians and stakeholders, especially in the field of budgetary laws and frameworks. We heard museums that are in many cases oriented towards permanence and preservation and not towards change. Their structures tend to be very rigid and inflexible. To give you some um, examples, for example, difficult employment contracts for cooperation with residents from non-European countries that are not based on academic degrees and do not determine the process results in advance, leaving the possibility to develop a cooperation project together from the beginning. This is very difficult. Or, for example, the impossibility of rewarded rewarding committed and innovative employees. Concluding, I would like to summarize that seeing the ethnographic museum as a general failure from the invention of the museum to the structural framework 
enables us to establish and to improve a self-critical reflection process that touches really the core of the institution. We cannot strip off our past, but we can rethink an ethnographic museum in a transparent and participatory way and an inclusive way, sharing also failures with partners and public. It will hopefully guide us to a new form of ethnographic museum for the 21st century. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ines de Castro. Thank you very much, thank you. Coming to our next sprint, sprint number four. As we all know, no, innova no innovation means, of course, no change, and no change means no future. And failure begets learning, that's also uh, a knowing. For the last sprint of today, we are talking with Michael Moriarty. He coaches individual leaders and leadership teams. The stage is yours, Michael. Thank you very much. An invitation to speak about failure um, does prompt a certain amount of self-reflection. And uh, I suddenly discovered that I've got a great deal of material to draw upon. Um, but I'm here, I'm still alive, and I can afford the price of a coffee. So what I'd like to do is share with you some thoughts on uh, how failure is a leadership responsibility, not in the sense of being held accountable. In 1807, Alexander von Humboldt, the preeminent natural philosopher of his day, published his essay on the geography of plants, in which he introduced his idea of Naturgemilde, uh, the concept of the wholeness of nature, that all of nature is interconnected and in a state of constant flux as one element acts upon another. Some 40 years later, in 1859, Charles Darwin, a man whose path in life was inspired by von Humboldt, published On the Origin of Species, which introduced the concept of evolution, of adaptation through natural selection. These two ideas, that our environment is in a state of constant change and that living beings need to adapt to this changing environment, were revolutionary in their day, but are now central to our perception of our world and of ourselves. I'm not impertinent enough to come to the Museum for Natural History and lecture its director on his own subject. Um, but what I would suggest to you is that what's good for the natural world is good for human affairs too. As even a cursory look at business and culture reveals, Kodak, for decades leaders in wet film, eclipsed by digital photography. Blockbuster video, extinguished by Netflix. Newsprint, pulped by online media. Developments manifested in this, the mobile phone, itself a product of technological evolution. If our context is a state of constant change, then we must always be going somewhere. And it's a leader's role to create a vision for this collective future, a vision which articulates the purpose and the relevance of their institution or organization, a vision with which their followers can identify, but not just identify. Visions must inspire. They need to connect at an emotional level, to appeal to the imagination, to be ambitious. Not every leader is in the business of landing men on the moon, but there has to be some stardust. The more ambitious and imaginative the vision, the less clear the path to that future is likely to be. By implication, what got us here will not necessarily get us there. So, we have to work out new ways of doing things. We have to innovate, because the alternative is finding that our context outstrips us, and that one day we wake up to discover ourselves relegated to irrelevance, or worse, eclipsed. 
Innovation's exciting. We all rush to examine the latest tech gadget um, or see what wonder Pixar has created to entrance our children. But for leaders, and often for those they lead, this excitement is tinged with fear because to innovate is to fail, repeatedly. And here's the paradox. If successful innovation is essential for survival, let alone preeminence in one's field, then so is failure. Yet we don't hire leaders to fail, and leaders don't like to fail. Why? Because by the time they've reached the pinnacle of their career as director of an institute or CEO of a large corporation, they've constructed an image in the eyes of others and in their own minds of a successful person. And to fail is to strike at the heart of their self-esteem. This aversion to failure is accentuated by the cultural lens through which failure is viewed, a negative lens. Failure is punished. There's no room for redemption in the court of public opinion. And it's a wonder that anyone would risk failure when the consequences are so public and so damaging. But it's a challenge that leaders must face up to if their organization is to successfully adapt to its changing context. The obstacles and their associated risks can be formidable. And Ines referred to some of them. Institutional inertia, stakeholder resistance, complacency and unquestioned assumptions, power and powerlessness incoherence and misplaced focus. The list is long. How then can leaders deal with the uncertainty in, the way, in a way that allows them to manage their personal anxiety, the fear of their followers, and the risks to their organization? It starts with a mindset and a method. It's the scientific method, experimentation, create a theory, Test it, observe the results, create meaning from them, then apply the insight to adjust the theory and repeat again and again. It's a methodology that served von Humboldt and Darwin well and which continues to work well today. It's even crossed over from science and from academia into more general management in the form of agile and similar philosophies as organizations have had to find ways of coping with the speed with which their context is changing. This is trial and error, and error is failure. This method, innovation by another name, involves repeated failure, and it involves the holding of ideas lightly as things to be adjusted in the light of evidence. As Henry Ford once said, failure is only the opportunity to begin again, more intelligently. You don't get that opportunity if you fear failure or you're dogmatic. So innovation requires a different mindset. That mindset is a learning mindset, one that sees failure as an opportunity to learn and thus to improve. And it's this mindset that has the power to liberate leaders from fear because it allows them to place their risk of failure in the context of and in right proportion to the gains of their vision. Yet the learning mindset alone isn't enough. History shows clearly that innovation flourishes in an environment of freedom. Freedom to exchange, freedom to experiment, freedom to imagine, freedom to fail, and freedom too from vested interests, from appeals to safety, and from the paranoia of the powerful. History also shows 
that innovation most often arises from the bottom up. Leaders, therefore, have to create a culture which enables this freedom. And here we return to fear, for it raises the questions, what happens if they let me down? And won't it all fall apart if I don't have control? And my answer is, surely the imperative to innovate dictates that the risks be taken. If you accept that premise, then you, the leader, have to be responsible for making failure possible. And it becomes a question of how, not if. So how? I'd suggest a learning mindset, free from fear and open to evidence, a vision which inspires and gives purpose, and which, above all else, is clear and clearly understood. A personal example of vulnerability, curiosity, humility, and courage. The empowerment of your followers, giving them the freedom that unleashes innovation. And a process by which to avoid chaos and harvest the learning. At the end of his long life, Alexander von Humboldt gathered together the accumulated knowledge of the natural world at that time into his final masterpiece, Cosmos. In a move echoed in today's open source software movement, he sent drafts of its chapters to scientists far and wide, many of whom he had encouraged and actively helped. There were gaps in the chapters which he requested them to fill with their knowledge, and he asked them to critique his writings he took those contributions, adjusting the final manuscript accordingly. In April 1859, he dispatched the final volume of Cosmos to his publisher. Three weeks later, aged 89, he died, an innovator to the end. He'd achieved his vision, and he was fearless of failure and open-minded to the last. Justly, he died the most celebrated man of his age. The question for you is, can you reframe failure to realize your vision? Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael Moriarty. Thank you. Thank you for your insights. And uh, without further ado, Let's move into the deep dives. What is a deep dive? A deep dive is a deep exchange between you, the participants, you, the audience, and of course, the speakers. So today we will have two speakers in a time of 20 minutes here, live exchange on the stage in the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin. And if you're watching the live stream, don't hesitate to send us your questions. Just tap the button, dabei sein, taking part at campus.republica.com. And before opening the panel, so to say, we always have a first responder presenting their thoughts with their visions and their backgrounds to our speakers. It's a kickoff, so to say, for our lively discussion. So you are also all invited. But the first responder will kick off the discussion. And today, I'm very honored to have Johannes Vogel, Director General of the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin, on stage, our first responder of today. A big round of applause, <laughs> Mr. Vogel. For our first deep dive, I'd like to call now Ines de Castro again on stage, director of the Lind Museum in Stuttgart, Staatliche Museum für Volkkunde, we already know, and of course, Mauro Jata Ludwigiak, independent art critic and curator. Thank you very much, and for you also, a big round of applause. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Vogel, as a first responder, listening to the first sprints, what have been your thoughts? 
Well, I mean, it's, it's absolutely obvious that you two personally, as well as with the organizations you've represented, um, have been thrown in at the deep end, that you had to um, work very, very hard to find a way to um, adapt to fast-moving, changing circumstances politically with you, and that you've been given an ethnographic museum um, in this day and age um, is um, a questionable joy, I would argue. So um, what, I, I mean, it's admirable how you've, how you've coped with it, but if you were to say to your colleagues, this is the really big learning, what would it be? What would be the one topic you want all our colleagues to understand? Oui. <laughs> a big question, <laughs> right, question. about learnings. <laughs> Ines, would you um, start and then we go on? Yes, well, it's, it's not an easy question, uh, but I would say perhaps that there is not only one answer. This is... Um, I have the impression that, especially in Germany, um, uh, people, the expectations towards museums are that they know everything, that they are the ones who teach, that they, told, they tell the truth. Yeah. And I think that this is not uh, something that we should, should follow up anymore. And um, I would like to envision a museum um, putting more questions than answers. Yeah. And, and, and really saying, I have no clue how it was, perhaps, yeah? I don't know if our audience would like that, yeah? Because they're still really, I think, seeking or looking for, for this kind of, of museum that, that teaches, yeah? But I think this is w one of the main points that I had to learn. Uh, with uh, together in the discussions with my staff and with uh, partners, uh, local and international partners, that there are many answers, many possibilities, many um, possibilities to see things, to order the world, to many um, yeah, ideas that uh, sometimes compete to each other and there is not only one. Not only one answer. And what is your biggest learning or learnings? <laughs> um, so if your question goes to the political context of, um, of populist regimes and, um, and far right-wing nationalistic governments, so unfortunately, the answer would be um, a little bit disappointing because I, I unfortunately, I think that um, there is no way to avoid failure. And you have no tools to do that because you can have the best managed institution and uh, um, inter international with international programs and also locally relevant programs. Um, and uh, it doesn't really matter for the decision makers. So um, what, what maybe I would... Um, um, advice that it's always a, um, uh, some, some trial worth, worth to do is um, uh, opening up also to um, less obvious publics. Uh, and we were trying to do that in the Center of Contemporary Art in Warsaw, to approach um, the more conservative publics um, uh, related to, for example, uh, John Paul II Foundation, uh, uh, that is also doing some, some, some program activities in Warsaw, uh, or, or this kind of, of, um, of publics that are somehow afraid to come and uh, and that don't see our uh, didn't see our offer as uh, as the one that is uh, designed for them. So um, so I think that this effort was really worth doing, and uh, and we really broadened our public at the end. Uh, but uh, but also at the end, <laughs> it's uh, it's uh, it's politically um, uh, yeah, it's 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 politically motivated decision of uh, of the I don't know Ministry of Culture or be that the, the, the head of some um, 
uh, um, some local, I don't know, the city or um, region, that is taking a decision. If it's driven by, if it's politically driven, politically in a sense of uh, populist discourse, nationalistic discourse, so there is no um, really, no tool to defend yourself and to defend the institution artists. Um, so, so unfortunately, how to learn from from this failure? Um, I, well, it, it, I don't have an answer today. <laughs> but when I listen to you, it appears that for you, circumstances and the way how a populist government wanted to interfere with culture was too fast for you to adapt. So, wouldn't it then be the lesson that you would like to give? to this global audience that as populism is rising everywhere, the type to, of approaches that you've chosen, reaching out to other communities, perhaps communities that are currently not reached by museums, has to be a key priority in order to perhaps sort of stay ahead of this rising tide of, um, of populism. Um, I mean, for you it was too fast and it ended in failure which um, I, I'm, I'm very, um, uh, it's, it's great to admire you for, for having the courage to talk about this and be here, but isn't it then for all of us to say, start running now and do it very fast and seek out the communities that you have neglected thus far? Well, that might be one of the um, of the possibilities. Also, working on the language that uh, that museums are using, art institutions are using, because I think that on the level of language, uh, they are creating. They are not wanting this, but they are crea creating certain exclusiveness. Yeah. And um, of course, education is also um, crucial. And, and also reaching out to as many potential publics as, as possible um, uh, with education. But, but at the end, it's um, the, the populist state, the populist regime, it's a kind of, um, I, see, I see it or see them as new colonizers. Yeah, yeah. Because, uh, because as they, uh, their intention is to provoke a change in a realm of the symbolic and in the historical politics. So, of course, museums are crucial tools to do that. So, to erase their narrative as, it, as we used to, um, to work with it, to build it for years, um, it's... Uh, it's uh, they understand the, the importance of such a gesture. And, um, and, and it's, it, it's also interesting, I, I can tell that by the example of many Polish institutions, not only the one I, I was leading, um, that in 100% in, in of the cases, the replacement of the director, because this this colonizing gesture, of course, um, is related to simply like replacing the director, but the po politically nominated one. In 100% of the cases, uh, as I am observing them or ex experience them during the last um, almost five years now, is um, mm, um, it, it's because the professional directors are replaced by non-professional ones, and as on on the um, on the far right right side, there is actually no offer for a narrative or no offer for um, for museums for art institutions. Uh, there is only the rejection. Uh, and yeah. mm. So so yeah. So I'd like to bring in a question from the audience from our live stream. So thank you very much for your question. And in case you have any questions, just give me a sign. But um, Giovanna Dunmar is asking. I was interested in the point you made about the elitist, exclusive and detached nature of many museums and the populist backlash against them. You spoke also of the need for museums to become more humble, more responsive and inclusive. Could this more inclusive museum become a bulkware, a bulwark against the rise in populism we are seeing around the globe, a dynamic part of the fight against it? How would you answer that? Um, 
Well, that's a, that's a very serious <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> and, and thank you very much for, for it. Um, if they could be um, a part of the fight, well, I think, I have an impression that the um, um, museums were a part of fight, have been a part of fight, but maybe it's a question about the tools. And, um, and to be in the fight, you can't take what I was uh, mentioning during, during my short introduction before. Um, they can't take this uh, stabilizing, safe position of critical distance. It's, of course, important. I, I don't say that we should like leave criticality, but, uh, but rather exceed it or extend it and get more involved um, in terms of relationships with, with the outside world. And, and the collection, the, the collection of objects, which is crucial for the museum definition as we know it, uh, it's also... Um, uh, a very strong stabilizing factor. I think that to be a museum on the move and a more engaged one, involved one, is, uh, is maybe the direction that we should um, follow to, to keep fighting. Thank you very much. I would go on. Oh, Mr. Fogel, do you have another question to Ines? <laughs> well, um, I mean, out, out, of, out of your, your excellent contributions here, um, comes very clearly, for me at least, the urge for a new narrative for a museum. Um, so, Ines, what, what do you think should be the, the three points um, on which around a new narrative um, should focus if we say that failure or building in failure has to be one of them? What, what else needs to, be, needs to be there? Or do we replace failure through humility that might be a well, well for, first of all, I'm, I'm not so sure if, if a museum should take part, sh should take a side yeah, in a conflict, for example. This is, this is something that we could perhaps discuss uh, later on. Okay, narratives. Yes, I think there are different narratives that we should uh, address in the museum. They should be, uh, they should be um, actual. They should, be, they should raise uh, topics that are really important for people. Uh, they should be subjective. Um, they should leave uh, this objective view of museums. And perhaps we started, for example, uh, with um, uh, many people that write our text, that they sign them so that you know um, whose text are this, who is speaking here, for example. Um, and they um, should show the different sides uh, or the different opinion uh, towards uh, one object or towards a uh, situation of the entangled history. Yeah. I think those three points would be crucial for me. Yeah. A question again from the live stream. So thanks again for your questions. I just quite check my back there. No questions right now, just to keep everybody involved. No, not yet, but give me a sign. I'm here for you. <laughs> All right, another question to you, Ines, from Katharina from uh, the live stream. You said you wish for a safe place where failure can be openly discussed in museums. Yes. In your opinion, what are the first steps that museums hmm. can take to foster a work culture that accepts failure as part of the process? Oh, I, I really don't know. This is, so really, I, I miss this. I think um, we are always talking about successes and uh, never about failure. And uh, we can only do that in a very personal um, uh, field. But I, I, I would like to have one of those places. I don't know. But um, if I think, for example, in directors' conferences, you would never, <laughs> never start with failure. Yeah, or perhaps we should start with failure. Okay, next time we will do that. <laughs> for example, or um, what kind of, yeah, uh, of uh, I don't know, what kind of space this could be. Yeah, um, it should be a safe uh, place where the media is not waiting for for it. For example, yeah. Uh, and, uh, but perhaps we should establish that. We should think about that. Yeah. yeah. There's a, another question from Alex. Um, also to you, all of us agree that we need a better failure culture. Could you state an instance in which you failed professionally? Sorry? Could you 
Could you state an instance in which you failed in a professional way? Oh, when we talk about fail every this day. Yes, it's not one. It's every day that I, I sometimes I really think, what the hell I am doing here? This is all wrong. Uh, we will never have an ethnographic museum today. This is something that is old-fashioned and that we would like to burn down, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> These are thoughts that I think uh, everybody of us uh, has. I think you cannot do leadership without uh, failure. And we do a lot of mistakes with, with staff, with decisions, with everything. Coming back maybe again to you, also from the live stream, which steps does a museum need to take to become a post-object museum from your perspective? Uh, which steps? Well, I... Or priorities, I, you know, it's also yeah. about prioritizing the steps. So what is the to-do list in number top three? I think it's... Um, uh, the, the, the first condition would be to start uh, exceeding the, the logic of production, because I think that museums and um, also, most probably the, the the institutions I was leading, yeah, because I think we were all lack, lacking some some kind of reflection sometimes as as museum directors. Um, uh, that that we uh, have been for many years part of these huge machines of production of commissioning commissioning new artworks to uh, to our collections, uh, are producing exhibitions, are uh, being forced to produce more events to 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 have um, a more public, um, bigger numbers. So, so I think that um, especially in the face of current crisis, we need really like slowing down. In many cases, I guess we need also downsizing in terms of uh, of of even the the structure, the infrastructure, the building. Buildings, um, and the economic crisis might uh, force museum directors to do so, and um, to to reflect more, to to center more on processes of, for example, collaboration with local communities, collab uh, collaboration with artists, um, uh, hosting new publics, and uh, uh, not necessarily with some effect. Uh, like waiting for the process and at the end mm -hmm. some some effect that is pre-assumed in the in the be beginning of the process i think slowing down really we need we all need that and museums also need that i believe but sorry there is no post object museum <laughs> <laughs> in my opinion museums have have ob objects <laughs> It, you can see the objects in another way, you can envision them, you can put them in the context, in the dialogue, and whatever, yeah? But I don't want to follow up the idea that we should get rid of the objects. Get rid of the objects, no, but, uh, but maybe um, to shift a little bit or to change the, the, the center of gravity. You know, uh, it's uh, to, to give him more importance to something that has been maybe a little bit omitted or, uh, or less important. Yeah, so the, that is my point, I guess, because I'm hi art historian. I don't want to burn museums and get rid of I know. objects. <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't want to burn them either. <laughs> But of course, I'm, I'm aware <laughs> it's it's kind of provocative uh, statement. Sure. But yeah. what if, uh, for example, we imagine, uh, just imagine, uh, like in a science fiction story, a museum uh, that has in its center community instead of collection, for example, yeah. the local community. We are running, unfortunately, but, but out of time. But that's exactly so. I, I, I would argue slowing down is exactly the wrong thing. I think we need to accelerate, but we shouldn't accelerate in the wrong path we've taken for the long time now. So exactly what you say, you have to become a part of the heart of the community you serve, be it local or be it global, and not hung up about some objects that you claim authority about to interpret what they mean. So that, I think I wouldn't even slow down, I would throw out. Um, but accelerate along the path of becoming relevant 
through and creating resonance. And that's something that museums, and especially museum leadership, internally and externally, needs to learn very fast. Thank you, Mr. Vogel. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, but I think I have the feeling we're going to continue tonight again with a glass of oh, wine, yes. right? Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you so much <laughs> to Margot Jata Ludwigiak and Ines de Castro. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Vogel. As a first responder, engaging. Thank you so much. And I'm still waiting for a few questions, so I'm checking my back. Give me a sign, right? I have everybody in my side. So coming to our next deep dive, deep dive number two. Of course, Johannes Vogel will stay with us. I'm happy about this. We're just quickly going to clean our chairs, and I'm going to check if there are already new questions coming into the program. Oh, yes. Thank you so much. The live stream is really engaged. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. I'm very much looking forward to ask these questions to our speakers. So with us is, of course, filmmaker and producer Lucy Darwin. Thank you. Please come on stage. And the international leadership coach Michael Moriarty, as we all know already. Thank you. And in case you've just dived in into our live stream, don't hesitate to ask your questions. Just tap the button, the Byzantine taking part at the page republica.com. Website, campus.republica.com. This is the right website, sorry for that. And send us your questions. Wonderful. Our first responder is again Johannes Vogel. What have been the first thoughts listening to our first two speakers? Now, I was really fascinated to hear your two views from a meta perspective on creative people and what it takes to lead. And I think the question that I would have to both of you from your observation and experience is, um, is sort of the seed of failure planted in us as directors because we are given free roam with our creativity that then be can become unchecked unbalanced and basically takes everything with them um, in the course of tenure. So is us giving power and try to try and give a director with creativity power, is that basically already um, the start of, of failure for the organization? Michael, would you start and then we go to Lucy? <laughs> They're we're both looking at each other, so I would just, <laughs> just make the start. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't believe it's the, the start of failure at all. I think um, the, the conferring of power, as you call it, um, and with it an expectation to do something with it, creative with it, um, just creates potential. Where that potential goes is very much down to the individual and the pressures, the external pressures, that the individual faces. I mean, there's some internal things as well, but you know, if, how, how much power does the director actually have? And does the director have a vision with which people can identify? I'd like to turn the question back on you, Johannes, um, which is that I know that you're about to embark on the most extraordinary project with this museum and that you've spent years um, with your passion for what you do, encouraging people to invest in a new future for this museum, the one that we're sitting in right now, which is an extraordinary place. And I'd like to know how you feel about the journey that you're about to embark on, and is that <laughs> journey potentially something that, I mean, you know, you're, you're going to fail at some well, point, th that's but you're not starting out with that. I think <laughs> the important thing is that nobody sets out with the feeling that they're going to fail. They set out with a huge determination and passion and commitment to what they're doing. And you are that person. And a lot of people that I've worked with in my career are, are people who have that 
energy and determination to do something good with uh, with what they're doing. And there's no difference, in my opinion, between somebody who's directing a movie and somebody who's directing an organization. Um, architects are very similar to film directors. You know, they they all have to have a view and a vision about what they want to achieve. And I suppose the thing is to be open with all the people that, and to have the right team around you and be open to what they bring to it and do that um, brilliantly along the way. So tell me, how do you feel about <laughs> your future 10 years? Because it's a 10-year project, right? Well, I mean, um, clear is that um, with the complexity and enormity of the project here, um, failure is a, has now become a really, really real option. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in many, many ways. Some of them one can control, others are way outside of one's control. And that is sort of, um, part, of the, part of the landscape, the guiding narrative um, that one has to deal with all the time. And um, the better your networks, the better your, you can listen and learn, uh, and the better the culture of learning openness and um, um, strong discourse is within the organization and within the network, I think the better one will be protected um, against um, doing the obvious failures. Um, the ones that just creep up, the ones that come from left or right, from populist politicians or God knows what, I think one can't really um, form, form form defenses against. They will just happen um, when they happen. But I think there's a lot of opportunity to create a culture that keeps an organization going um, to, to weather many, many storms. And in a way, um, and this is why I liked really what, what Michael has said, it is um, important which culture you create in an organization and within your networks and teams um, that will in the end carry the organization forward. The directors, just to come back on that, and it's really important, the directors that I've worked with, um, the two that I've been talking about in, in my sprint earlier, both of them have incredibly open relationships with the people that they, you know, the, the key people that they work with. And they are, uh, they allow those people to do their jobs to their, you know, their maximum ability. And they do it with huge humility, both of them. So, you know, neither of them would say to a person who's in charge of the camera department, I think you should do things like this. They're asking the question from them to, you know, to make sure that they are in, in the right place and on the right page. Um, and they trust them implicitly. And I think trust is mm. absolutely central to all of this. Trusting the people that you, you have around you and being open to quickly open to um, changes and ideas. I, Michael, I, from a coaching perspective, yes. Yeah, I was just answer. going to, to echo that. I mean, I think trust is an absolutely essential component of this culture um, because you can't do it all yourself. And the thing that, uh, the, another essential component is that everybody has to understand what the organization is trying to achieve. So your vision, and if that is in place, and trust, then you can be confident that if you go off track, it's not intentionally. Mm. And have a look around. There's one question. Yes. I'm Jordan, but I'm from the whole afternoon, but I we have a microphone. Give me one second. So the live stream, the live stream can hear you as well. In when we used a microphone. I've got, a, anyway, a loud voice. Thank you. Thank you. I enjoyed really both of your presentations. I enjoyed all of the presentations. Um, I think failure is being treated as a single thing. And for me, there's no black and white between sex, success and failure. And as somebody who creates things, you know if you've done something well or not. So whatever somebody else says, mm. you know, you don't have to believe it. So I mean, I think we should talk a bit more about the definition of failure. And because it's being treated just as a, well, it seems to be a single concept mm. because no one's really defined it or widened what can be a failure. But of course, failures help us move forward. And I think Lucy, your speech, Lucy Darwin, reminded me of a fantastic speech at the RA a few years ago 
by Marina Abramovich and on the essential nature of artists or, or creative people have to have failure as part of their mm. career. It, it's essential. But I think if, if I would ask each of you to maybe just define a bit more what you mean by failure, because it can't be only economic. That would be terrible. No, I mean, I... Th what's your definition, exactly? Oh, no, sorry, but can I just come back on that? That's really interesting. Um, I think you said, at the beginning, you just said, and I'm just going to try and get it right, something about how um, it's not... Uh, it, it's, it, it can be an existential thing. It's about whether or not you... Is that the right way to describe it? It's about how you feel about your work. Yeah. Yes? Yep. Okay, well... That's fine to a point, but we are in a, you know, that would be fine if, let's say, for example, because I've used these already, Woody Allen or, or Terry Gilliam put their own money into those films and then it doesn't matter what anyone, it doesn't matter what anyone else, think, anyone else thinks. And actually, for both of those men, it really doesn't, it matters differently, actually. Woody Allen doesn't care what anyone else thinks about his work and that's a very comfortable place to be. He never goes back, he's never seen any of his films. After he's finished them, he just puts them aside. So for him, it really is that kind of lovely, perfect place for an artist where you can just move on and evolve. And as I was trying to say in my speech, you're building, in your work, you're building on both successes and failures. But he's totally aware of when things don't quite work. For Terry, it's different because his budgets are so much bigger and people will look at them and say, you know, commercially, we're not going to take that risk. And he can't do it himself. So he's reliant on external, external people who make decisions for him. And, and that's where it breaks down and that's where it's, it's problematic because you know, to, to go back and find more money to do another project if what you've done doesn't quite reach um, uh, the people in uh, either commercially or artistically. Mm. Have I made any sense? I'm not quite sure to work. Yes, I, I look forward Wonderful. to that. Very much. Michael. Yeah, I, <laughs> yes. I, I just, I mean, it speaks, to, it speaks exactly to, to Sarah's point that, or oh, sorry, Lucy's point, that, um, that failure means different things to different people. Mm. So, Trying to define failure, I think, is almost a fruitless task. And, and when you consider you know, the scientific method, which I sort of referred to, you know, the, the idea of the scientific method is not to produce a successful result. It's to produce a result and then interpret it. So the idea that the, the result is there to either prove or disprove. So who's to judge whether it's a failure or a success? Mm. Although people do judge. And that's the problem. <laughs> yeah. and they, I have some and, they, and, and actually, in this day and age, um, with, the, uh, with the speed at which everything is disseminated, mm. um, it's worse than ever. Yeah. Yeah, because, but, but because, you know, I, I remember when I first started in cinemas and I, was at, I tore the tickets in cinemas when I was 20 years old and, and um, <coughs> you know, I, it was the beginning of, of a long passion with, uh, with film. I remember that you could open a film on a Friday and by the Monday it could be gone. Mm. If you didn't get enough people on seats, if you didn't get the right reviews, that was it. And, and part of the problem also is that there's no space for nuance no. in the public arena yep. and, and nuance is essential if you're, if you're innovating. But there is a layer in between the artist and the public, yeah. and that layer is full of executives. <laughs> Suits. This brings okay. me to a question um, of, of the live stream. Oh, really? Okay. Yes. Well, I, I just want to say that the sooner that we can have a direct <laughs> relationship with our audience and the internet will, I promise you, in the next 18 months, I've, I've seen the future. Actually, no, I have a friend who's working on this. but. Um, there will be a way in which filmmakers can get their films to the audience without this layer in, in the middle, provided there are still people willing to finance them. So all the, all the philanthropists out there, please think about this for the future. Coming to a, a question out of the live stream, so thanks again, dear participants, to you, Lucy. You stated that the journey to success includes failure, and you said that the film industry needs a more philanthropic 
philanthropic approach. How do we make it possible in an ever-growing data-driven society? Coming out of the live stream. <laughs> we make it possible by, um, by allowing filmmakers to speak to their audiences directly. There will be a platform, and the platform will actually do m many things very usefully. First of all, it will massively improve the, uh, the reach of the art. So, you know, at the moment, I've got a film which the streamers have rejected. They've rejected it not because it's a bad film. It got amazing reviews out of the two first festivals we had in, in the States, but it doesn't fit their commercial narrative. So that means that I don't have the method to get my film to the audience. I also can't put it in a cinema at the moment because there are no... I mean, there are cinemas, but they're showing Tenet and Bond mm. um, <laughs> because that's what the cinemas need, commercially speaking. Um, so the sooner that we can have a, a democratic way of filmmakers being able to show their films to their audience and for audiences to know where to come to see those films, uh, the better. But that is an interesting one because one could argue that museums, especially with low or no entrance, actually had that opportunity already for quite some time mm -hmm. to be open to everybody and hasn't, haven't really grasped it. Mm -hmm. So um, I think there's something for us, for us as museums to learn because we can directly reach our audiences without intermediaries, but we are not mm -hmm. doing so. so um, mm. well, <laughs> I was just going to say that you do have, you know, the intermediaries are, 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 the, are the people that are, are making your space accessible. There are ways in which okay. you are already experimenting, and that's the thing I love about this museum, is that you're already thinking about how you can be more progressive, how you can, you know, you've, you've tried. You've tried and you've been making some experiments already. And I really look forward to seeing what's <laughs> going to happen next. Michael, I have another question for you. Or do you want to add something? Well, I just uh, quickly... Quickly, and then I join so, with the question. So talking about sort of <laughs> creating a, a space aside for experimentation. Um, as organizations grow, they ossify, and it becomes harder to innovate. And th a way around this, which Procter & Gamble, for example, did, was they simply outsourced a large part of their R&D. Um, other organizations create a hive off special mm. units like Google's X, which is dedicated and has the freedom mm. and, importantly, the resource to explore completely off the wall ideas. Yep. And so, um, for, for larger organizations that struggle culturally with the freedoms necessary for innovation, that's a potential route. A quick last question. Should we accept failure as a part of our work to be successful, Michael? And how should leaders deal with their employees when they fail? Sorry, can you repeat this? Yes. Question? Should we accept failure as a part of our work to be successful? And how should leaders deal with their employees when they fail? <laughs> Reward them. I, Sorry. I, <laughs> I'm I, just jumping in. <laughs> Reward them. I, I, don't, I don't think it's... <laughs> necessary, necessarily necessary to fail mm -hmm. to be successful. Mm -hmm. um, but if you fail, you should learn from it. Mm -hmm. That's the only rule. Mm -hmm. And if people do not learn, be it employees or directors, that's when action has to be taken. Mm -hmm. Not when they fail, when they do not learn. That would be my point. I think that probably answers the second part of the question very well. Then there's another question from the live stream. In the previous days, it was mentioned that museums and cultural institutions could learn from the startup sector. What do you think, to Michael, what do you think are the key learnings museums can take away from the startup culture, from this entrepreneurial spirit, I think in terms of failure, but also, of course, in terms of development? I, I think the, the, um, the thing about startups is that um, they're intensely creative, and they are intensely, uh, amazingly open. They're open to ideas, and they connect, and they communicate, and they just reach out for anything which will have a multiplying effect on what they're doing. And, um, and, and I think, you know, a, the same principle applies here. Um, in a museum, 
create the opportunity um, for that openness, for that connection to happen, and the ideas will come. Mm. Thank you so much. Thanks to Lucy Darwin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Michael Moriarty and to Johannes Vogel. This is your round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And of course, thank you everybody watching us and thanks for participating. Coming next now after the break, our closing panel of the Martin Roth Symposium, Back to the Future with Marion Ackermann, Julia Grosse, Andreas Görgen and Ronald Kretz. I see you soon. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back here in the live stream and of course at the Martin Roth Symposium here in the Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin. Throughout the past days, throughout the week, we dealt with all the different museums-related topics, such as museums and futures, museums and power, museums and entertainment, and of course, museums and architecture. And today, we are diving into Back to the Future. It's my pleasure to introduce you to the speakers of this final panel. We have with us Dr. Andreas Görgen. He is the Director General for Culture and Communication at the German Federal Foreign Office. Welcome. And this is your applause. Yes. <laughs> we have with us Professor Dr. Marion Ackermann. She has been the Director General of the Staatliche Kunstsammlung in Dresden since November 2016, and she sets up numerous projects with young artists. Welcome, Frau Ackermann. <laughs> Welcome, Ms. Ackermann. And we have with us Ronald Kretz, Secretary General of the Institute for Auslandsbeziehungen, Mr. Kretz. And last but not least, welcome. And last but definitely not least, we have the Editor-in-Chief of Contemporary and, and Contemporary and America Latina, Julia Grosse. So we like to engage, of course, now today, we had several topics during the symposium. We are now curious about your insights, about your experiences into the so-called future of museums in the context, what I just mentioned, in the context of power, in the context of entertainment, architecture, and in the context of today, museums and failure. That's what we've discussed all day long. So we're going to start a little bit with the past and into a look, with a look into the past and previous days. Maybe you share with us the highlights of your days. But I'd like to share with you, Ms. Grosse, as you were already part of the symposium on the second day of the symposium. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to yeah, hear your point of view and maybe, of course, your personal learnings. What would you see, in fact, as the social function of a so-called museum? Oh, that's a big, a big one. It's a big question. And um, um, it was a very interesting week. And, um, what I found interesting or find interesting is that um, um, although all the foci were very different, as it, you know, as I was just mentioning, um, focusing on architecture, on failure, on power, etc., um, still I had the feeling that at the end of the day, most of us kind of ended up circling around the same questions in a way, or the same topics, which obviously have to do with power again, at, you know, at the bottom line and. Um, you know, really questions regarding power, how do we, or we, the museums, get rid of power? Um, how can they, you know, start sharing power? Of course, this is something we've just discussed, you know, museums kind of tried this for the last 30, 40 years to get rid of power. Uh, at least maybe they didn't try, but they knew that they have to get rid of power and um, distribute it in a, you know, just horizontal way. And um, the thing is, by doing this, and this is something I found really interesting, and um, you know, listening to the different uh, discussions, etc., by doing this, you create something new, which obviously has nothing to do with power if you share a power with many. Yeah? But in a way, this is such a contemporary and, again, powerful move to do this. And um, this is uh, what I found very interesting, that um, you know, all the different perspectives and discussions always came back to this one conclusion and um, you know of course we looked inside the museum and what has to be changed there I was just coming from the lavatory you know and it was just the one-to-one -one reality the person cleaning there was was wasn't white was black yeah and here 
nobody's black except me <laughs> and, and Yvette. Yeah? So um, this kind of reality is the reality um, I think most museums in Europe and um, North America are still facing. And um, of course we haven't you know, found answers to that problem, but um, I'm very positive that in a way we can't go back now. You know, even you know, museums have tried to change. Um, or but hooking up again my question, mm -hmm. what would you see as a social function then of a museum? Yeah, of course, be a yeah. Responsibility? yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, obviously, you know, if we look at the infrastructure of museums, you have to become more diverse. You know, just the example I was just mentioning, don't stop, stop looking at diversity when you look at your cleaning staff and security. But, you know, we talked about the board members, uh, the Freundeskreise, for example, the, you know, Association of Friends at a museum. Um, you know, a museum can claim to have a very global, um, diverse um, curatorial program, etc. But as long as the, the inner structure is still super homogeneous, uh, you know, the curatorial teams, etc. if there's no single non-white person inside or diverse person, doesn't have, you know, even have to do with, with migration backgrounds, but the class as well, yeah? If you don't have this included in your inner structure, you still haven't done your homework in a way as a museum, I think. And um, this is, for example, one way, and I could go on there, many things, looking at the visitors we talked a lot about, or the different groups about the aspect of the visitors, um, and you know their their power, the power visitors have nowadays, and um, that museums, you know, if they claim, for example, like the Tate always claims, uh, representing the whole of society. What is what is society? Yeah, and um, that came up as well during this week. Um, that museums have to go this extra mile and kind of do research and find out who the society is when they talk about heritage, for example, mm -hmm. because I think heritage is important as well. If uh, museums reflect. Um, heritage of a society, they have to know what heritage they're talking about in order to really be inclusive. And um, I, you know, looking back at what the whole week gave me. A full me, week, yes. Yes, what, what it gave me, I was quite struck and very interested in this aspect of entertainment. That was something I thought was super interesting because it kind of bundles many aspects when it comes to um, social accessibility as well. Absolutely. We're coming into entertainment yes. and these questions in a minute. Mm -hmm. Give me one more time and a few more questions to the other speakers. But thank you very much for the beginning. Mr. Kretz, one of the questions that was often raised this week and during the previous days is also how museums can become and can be spaces for experiences than just showrooms for objects, let's say, who actually makes a museum? And of course, between creating experience and open spaces, where do you see the role of a museum as a cultural mediator? As a cultural mediator, well, finally, I think we all are cultural mediators. Organizations like CIFA, as well as a lot of other uh, organizations, if you see yourself as a kind of, of building bridges, mm -hmm or a translator, or platform, or a space of, of communication. And if you um, think that on this basis of communication, or, uh, you have to, to give the, the, the opportunity to, to reflect about issues, to share your knowledge, to explain maybe your, your values, for example, then you are, I think, a good cultural mediator. And what we learned here, and we learned a lot about ourselves, yeah? We, for me, we didn't talk only about museums, I talked about the IFA as well. <laughs> as institutions or as personal learnings as well? No, we have to change as institutions. We learned how, how we have to change, how we have to, to react to, to what Julia said, or to the new nationalism, or to, 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 to protect democracy, for example, yeah? And um, that's, I think, um, the, good, the good way to, to look for new formats, to look for formats who are more co-creating, co-producting, co-curating, for example. And that's the modern form, I think, of, uh, cultural, med of cultural mediator. And the museum, of course, is one of these kind of institutions. Mm. Yeah. 
Thank you. Well, throughout the whole week, we had several digital events. We had sprints and deep dives as today as well. We created a graphic recording. I explained it already earlier to sum up the findings of each day as we discussed about futures, about power, entertainment and architecture. And earlier today, we took this recording, as you know, as a starting point for four analog workshops. And each workshop concentrated on one of the daily topics of today about failure, but also created a compass to envision the museum of 2030 together. And out of these workshops, I have now burning questions, so-called burning questions. And I'd like to start with the first burning question to you, Ms. Ackermann, talking about power. Why are museums shying away from acting up on what we know has to change? That is a question out of the Werkstatt. Wow, that's a question, and I feel relaxed because I know I can, I have, I'm allowed to fail. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it in general that, that all museums um, are avoiding um, these um, um, cha these changing processes. But um, I, I felt quite comfortable today with a um, um, lecture of Margot Charta from Poland, where she 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 spoke about the model of assemblage, of assemblage, and that. Um, uh, when, when you take a museum as an institution, as an assemblage of, of different possibilities to, to, um, to be guardians of your collections and at the same time agencies for in, in, in society to bring things forward. And the one parts are more perhaps concentrating on these preserving and, and um, dealing with other forms of audiences. And then there are some parts of this assemblage very much trying to change things. Um, this could be a more realistic model, but it, it is difficult. For example, I, I tried to, be, because um, my colleague Ines da Castro said the whole construction of the Ethnologische Museum is a, is a failure in itself. It's a false construction. And I tried to ask an African colleague to become director of this Ethnological Museum in Germany. Um, or to have a co-director's um, responsibility to, to give away power and to, um, to define it totally new. But it failed in reality. <laughs> um, so it, it is difficult. And, and then you speak about the institutions without walls and about accessibility. Um, Martin Roth, it was the key word of Martin Roth uh, since I knew him, accessibility. But I must say, in reality now, we had a theft in the Green Vault, oh, in the Green Vault and we had um, acts of aggressions from right-wing people in Leipzig when we had an exhibition on Muslim themes. Um, and so security is now the moment our main topic. Um, then safety, through the um, pandemic crisis, um, we had to um, postpone exactly these exhibitions, which has been more experimental and with tactile elements, and, the international, and many of the international projects. Um, and it's about safety and your liability, because you are liable when somebody has an infection. So at the moment, it is quite difficult. But being more optimistic, um, I would say it is... So the institutions itself, the museums, um, they have these gravity, these, they have this heavy load. Um, it's very important to change them inside. Mm. Museum without walls um, we, means for me uh, also the internal walls. It means that um, the hierarchy is inside between archives and libraries and collections and all these aspects. When it's more fluid, then the museum is much more able um, to take responsibility for the change processes in society. But a follow-up question, are museums, would you say, afraid of change? Not me, but <laughs> I know many people who are afraid of change. <laughs> um, of course, the question of power and being stable, stabilize your power is uh, also something. But, but the whole system of who gives you the money, especially for the state museums. So our colleague Zelfira, in her message from Russia, um, she said um, she's uh, supported by private sponsors in Russia, not by the state so much. Um, so it is such a complex structure. Um, and 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 uh, you need so many resources um, to, to even to protect, even to be a guardian of the culture. So we are also memory institutions. That's also one of our functions. So 
it's, it's difficult to have these quick changes. So, but you need, of course, a certain form of leadership. And I was very happy to hear about, learn more about this uh, leadership to where can embrace uncertainty. Um, when, you, when you are able to um, work with these new forms of leadership and bring it inside your teams and bring it to your supporters and stakeholders, then I think um, it should be possible. Mm, very interesting. And of course, you were mentioning steps that have different sizes. Corona, COVID-19 all forced us to maybe go a big step. Will the next steps be smaller for the museums? No, the other way around. I, I see a big chance in the crisis we had. Um, so many, many changes were possible only now. So um, com um, starting with um, the more fluid forms of digital communication. One example, it was always so complicated to work with the Emirates. Um, and now we, we founded a virtual change cultural academy and we have every month a Zoom conference on discussing our topics together. And it's so easy going. Um, and um, for example, home office and all new forms of work, it was very complicated in state institutions, it was forbidden. And now everything's very normal. So many, many things changed in the last weeks. So I'm very optimistic concerning that. Thank you, Ms. Ackermann. Talking about entertainment at the Werkstatt Entertainment, Ms. Grosse, I have a question for you coming out of this Werkstatt. What makes me decide to go to the museum, in fact? And how do you make the visit, uh, how do you make the visit more relevant, accessible, shareable, and interactive? This is a direct question from the Werkstatt. What is your perspective on that? Right, tough minute, questions today, right? <laughs> Um, yeah, maybe um, that connects nicely to what I just uh, was mentioning, um, that I uh, enjoyed a lot um, listening to the sessions and deep dives and um, sprints focusing on the entertainment, because um, um, there was uh, one speaker, um, Raphael de Courville, yeah, and he is an interaction designer, and I loved his example that he says, you know, he has to do with you know, museum people, um, directors, curators, and, you know, as soon as he puts entertainment on the table, they're all like, oh, oh God, back off, yeah? And um, this, this um, idea of still many museums in at least Germany, let's say, yeah? This fear of entertainment rather than learning from entertainment. This is something I find extremely interesting because, um, you know, entertainment is such a... No, I don't like the word including, but it, it, it touches or it speaks to a wide audience or to, you know, big part of society. You know, I love Beyoncé, my daughter loves Beyoncé, our colleague in Nairobi loves Beyoncé as well. And this is something um, the museums can learn from, I think, yeah, um, to, to see how can we obviously... Um, tell the whole, the whole story, the whole history of a museum, the dirty parts as well, the painful parts, but at the same time be um, enjoyable or you know, be, a, be a place of encounter, of pleasure, of entertainment as well. So this is what I find interesting, how to get, you know, to get these aspects together. Connected pleasure part. and pain, let's say. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gergen, listening to the speakers so far, would you say the Germans or the museums are a little bit shy with entertainment here? As I just heard it a little bit. Oh, that, that's not uh, not up to me. You know, I'm I'm coming. I'm a bureaucrat, so I'm not the right person to talk about joy. Um, <laughs> that's what you said per, right per, now. Per, <laughs> per definition. <laughs> per definition. Um, no, ju just on, I want to jump in on on two aspects. The first aspect is when we discuss about power. Everybody on this panel has a kind of power, and there is no powerless society. That might be a financial capital as power in the private sector, that might be a, a social capital, or that might be a symbolic capital. So, and in that very German society, everybody is Dr. Professor and, and has made 15 years of studies, has been elected to 17 boards and 13 um, 13 institutions, and then he comes to power, and then he's considering that he has power. And then he gets fear. Um, and that's something, I think, in our society which we have to open, and we have to open through diversity, through other ways to influence institutions, 
Uh, and that's what, what I, my lesson from these 100 hours of lessons is that, that enjoyment and playfulness is taking a chance. And, and it's our responsibility to give that chance to others. We are all, we both, we are male 50-year-old whites. So uh, we made it in such a society. And now it's our responsibility to make it happen and to give others a chance, to take their chance and to change a society. And that means also to change an institution. And I'm very happy to work together with, with you since, I don't know, 10 years, no, seven, eight years. Yeah, yeah. Um, Marion has been one of the most important museums directors who influenced my work. Um, but we all agree that it ups, it's up to us to, to allow other people to take a chance. So, and, and this is playfulness and enjoyment. Uh, it's not that heavy German burden, I, I have a responsibility and I have to assume my responsibility. That's just boring. I have a question for you from the Werkstatt, a burning question, from the architecture Werkstatt, which leads us a little bit into the direction, but also goes, of course, into the walls of the museums. How can museums be built more flexibly in order to be more accessible and communicative. Uh, David Ajay said, Let's, we have to build museums as tools for, for lost stories. Mm -hmm. And this is directly linked to what is discussed through the name of, of touching tales and uh, multi-directional memory. Um, and that's also a European responsibility. If we pretend that our objects are universal objects, they will remain universal objects in Lagos as well as in Berlin. Uh, and as in a society of immigration, we have so many touching tales, tales coming from other countries but being no German tales. Um, and I think this is the answer to your question. So the architecture has to become open without losing what is good in our country. And a museum as an independent, publicly financed institution is something we consider as an advantage, something we, have, we can offer as a role model to be adapted. Thank you very much. I have another question for you, Mr. Kretz, coming also from the Werkstatt, the Futures Werkstatt. Can we shift power to the audience to change the definition of the museum and give so to say, new assignments to corridors. <laughs> it's a little bit like what Andrea said. <laughs> no, we have to give them the, the, the possibility, the opportunity to, to change our institutions, to change and to, to make it to their um, museum, for example, but as well to influence the, the exhibitions. I have an example. We have a, a an exhibition which I love very much. It's called Future Perfect. In this exhibition, there are three back packages, art. Yeah, in the exhibition, three back packages. But the, order, the, the visitors are allowed to take them and to leave the museum with them and to, to take them for, for a whole day only to bring them in the afternoon back to the exhibition and to put them in the exhibition. Perfect. Every day, someone takes one or <laughs> three persons take three of the back packages and every time they bring them back. Yeah? And I think so, they, they, they made the exhibition to their experience. And that's the way we should... Um, um, uh, work, I think. That's this kind, of how we should change the power because the audience has a, a, a huge power. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Of course, Ms. Cross. Oh. <laughs> I think as well, um, I think the audience or, or society should be aware, especially in Europe or in Germany, that they have power because they're the taxpayers to pay for the bloody museums, yeah? And I think many people don't even know that, you know, that they... Do they don't know it or do they, do they don't want to think know I think they it? don't know. I think they don't know that 100% are taxpayers who pay for museums, but only, you know, the museums serve, let's say, only 30%. Maybe it's not a fixed figure, yeah? Just a small amount of people who are kind of addressed in the program of a museum. And I think this is kind of power as well if people say, okay, I pay for this, but I'm not reflected in the program. It doesn't speak to me, so... Um. Yeah, I know, it's complicated. Um, yeah, because so. we consider citizens not as a consumer who pay mm -hmm. for something. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the freedom of arts and science is even protected against a public will. 
mm -hmm. um, and then we need those spaces of liberty mm -hmm. um, to, to open, to give an opportunity to think beyond an actual society. Mm. Um, but, but, but still, as a citizen, and if a museum is part of a res publica, mm -hmm. of a common good, then even without paying taxes, you have a say you in have, that yeah, institution. Yeah, that's true. Mm. Yeah. Ms. Ackermann, how is your perspective on that? Can we give or can we shift power to the audience to create a new label or to change the definition of the museum? Um, I think it is. Um, there are wonderful moments when it's ha when it's happen. Um, for example, we had these um, intense discussions on um, in inside Germany on Eastern and Western tradition of art after from 40, 45 to 89, and um, and and so the the audiences they came to us and they wanted to see the art from these years and. And I must confess, it, it lasted quite long, as we really understood, as we from the Western part. Of. Um, and, and so we used the museums as platforms for very, very intense discussions. And at the end, we learned so much from it. And this was a moment where really the audience overtook <laughs> the role of curating. Uh, uh, now, I, I ask myself how it will be possible. Um, to, is it possible to do this also in digital platforms? Um, or do you need um, do you need to to meet personally? Um, I, I discussed it especially with my colleagues in Eastern European countries, um, and you know, in 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 Poland or um, Czech Republic and Russia, there's a lot, there's strong tradition um, of using the followers and the um, internet platforms to have the very open also political debates, uh, to, to be more independent from, from political influence. When you have so many followers, you can also um, have a certain form of power. Um, so I, I think it is very important to create the possibilities that the audiences can take over. But the museums have to stick with the impulses. We are already discussing a little bit the future where I'm heading now in our last third mm -hmm. of our panel. I'd like to look into the future as we call this panel back to the future. We heard a lot in last days and um, of course we discussed on a local level, on a global level on about local challenges and global challenges throughout continents and different time zones in our digital theme week. And one challenge of course is the current world pandemic. So guiding the question, can museums collaborate on a global scale to find innovative solutions for these big crises, for these big challenges, such issues as local and global challenges? And if so, how, Mr. Gergen? How is it possible? Well, have a look, have a look in the times of the Great Depression in the United States in the 30s. One of the first programs has been the federal program number one. And that was a call for tender for artistic projects in a time of, of deep change. So the answer is yes, it's evident. It's evident if, if arts and culture are spaces in which a society can reflect upon what is going beyond an actual state. In, a, in crisis times, we, even, we need even more science and arts because we need to look beyond. Um, and and from, the, from the future, we can redesign the present. Um, so um, the answer is yes. And do Easy we need task. more collaboration in times of crisis as well? Sorry? Do we need more collaboration, of course, in times of crisis as well? You know, you know we are here in the midst of Berlin and in the midst of Europe. And I think Europe and those national, there are several national states. Okay, wonderful. There are some national states who, which know that they are small and, um, and some which did not yet understand that they are small states. <laughs> uh, and talking as a citizen of a small state, firstly, there is no answer to any global challenge on the basis of a national state. So, yes, there is no alternative to cooperation and there is no alternative to Europe. Second is, in Europe, we talk about resilience, threats. We feel threatened by Russia, by China, by I don't know what. We are one of the richest continents. We have exploited all other continents for 
some hundred years, and now we feel threatened. <laughs> I think it's strictly our responsibility to make an offer and, and to say, hey, it's working. Democracy and a kind of republic, it's just working and we have something to offer. And that means to open up for cooperation. Okay, when I talk about collaboration, I'd like to be a little bit more concrete. Maybe you tell us a little bit more about the so-called museum museums. agentur. Well, well, that's a fantastic idea. We, we have developed with roughly 20, 30 museums, mm. together with the Ministry of Cooperation, the Ministry of Culture, to say, okay, we want to propose to make an offer for the cooperation of museums, talking about great exhibitions, as well as investing in cultural infrastructure. When I said earlier, if an object is of universal value, then it's as well of universal value displayed in Lagos than displayed in Berlin. Um, and when you have a look on what our Chinese competitors are doing, which offer another kind of model for society, then you see that they are heavily investing in the cultural infrastructures in Africa. And it's up to Europe and to us to decide if we want to participate in that or not. And, and I, I would consider we have to, um, not only for the reasons of the past, because we have exploited those regions, but also in order to offer a model of democracy and how we could shape a society um, to other parts and to change our own understanding of what is a society of the future. Herr Kretz, how are you committed to that, to the such cooperation ideas and, of course, I, uh, visions in, in, in well, the first, first of all, I think it's, it's a brilliant idea and it helps us in the foreign cultural policy. All the initiatives, all the new um, collaborations will help us to, to create a better um, uh, foreign cultural policy and we would like to support the, the, the uh, agency of what's oh, called now officially. Um, with our experience of, of the Biennial of Venice, for example, made by IFA or organized by IFA since 40 years, or with our great archive of, of artworks, with the um, um, research program, which works as, as well for the art department at IFA, for, for example, what means creating nowadays or in the future. Yeah? Of course, we have a lot of instruments to bring in. In, the, um, in collaborations, in the boards or juries or whatever, of course, it's a great chance for us, for us. Yeah, good idea. Ms. Ackermann, as a director of a museum, what would be your point when you listen to these ideas and visions of collaboration? What is your hope as well on this topic? And there's no alternative, alternative to international cooperation. But I must say, um, in the last years, when there were so many political um, difficult uh, situations, like uh, the Brexit and, and the election of Trump and so on, um, the international community um, became more and more intense. So our exchange is better than ever. Um, and, and you feel, I would say, uh, among our colleagues from the cultural institutions, we really live it together. We live Europe, we live in really international community. We, dis we discuss at the moment, we have a group, we discuss every six weeks um, racist themes and all these. Um, um, so I, I'm very happy about this, um, but we need support um, from the Museum Academy and from other, from other institutions, perhaps. For example, we are dreaming of shared heritage since a long time, but it's so difficult to solve it. Um, we, we try to do a common research with people from four continents or so, writing in one document, doing research together, but it's quite, quite complex. Um, so we need more digital technologies. Um, then um, all these contradictions, we have it in the ethnological museum. So uh, people from indigenous people want to come and touch the art, artworks. Our uh, people from con conversation department say, no, not touching it. Or they coming from Australia want to see the gemstones and telling uh, we don't want that women are going near to the objects. We say, we are, <laughs> as women, directors and curators. So there are so many um, contradictions and conflicts, and um, we need partners um, to help us, um, yeah, to, to come to, to find common, nice solutions between us, yeah. And this is, there's many things to do still, so <laughs> I think that will be <laughs> your challenge for the next years, yeah.
Thank you. Second last question as we're running again out of time. Ms. Grosse, when you're looking ahead to the Martin Roth Symposium 2022, what is your idea and of course your wish uh, for next level of discussion? What should we point on? <coughs> yeah, ideally that we're not, you know, like, uh, what's the title? Täglich Grosses Mummeltierch? I don't know the, the English term, that we don't, you know, repeat the same questions again in, 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 in two years, but hopefully have come to at least some results uh, and you know the good thing is things are starting already you know I just uh, loved that story at the British Museum I read it some days ago that they moved not removed but moved um, um, Hans Sloan's um, sculpture um, he's the founding father of the, the British Museum from the plinth or what is it a ped pedestal yeah to a very unglamorous vitrine yeah Uh, alongside other very critical um, contexts, focusing obviously on uh, colonial history of Britain and the British Empire, etc. And of course, it's a small move, but you know, it created an outrage, you know, especially within the older generations who really feel like the whole world is falling apart. And I can, kind of can understand this, but you know, this whole idea of history has been such a fairy tale. And um, I loved what. Um, has been said this week, um, what, what is that, um, this is just an example, that in the UK people um, tend to consume history as a place of relaxation, yeah, the old history, yeah, so this is why the shock must be so big now, that this kind of history <laughs> where you felt at home because it affirms power, obviously, again, yeah, this is kind of falling apart and looking at the reality, which is um, uh, not beautiful or glamorous, so I think I'm, I don't know, I'm quite optimistic because people, uh, things are starting to really change and, you know, um, sculptures are pushed from plinth into the water, etc. Something I've never seen before in a European context, so it's... Um, So you're yeah, optimistic. I think it's starting. Yeah. You're hopeful. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gretz, last question to you. Martin Roth Symposium 2022, give us an outlook. What is on your to-do list, maybe? Or what, what is on your list to find the corporations <laughs> and the networks that are needed for the networks of tomorrow? Just the top three, yeah, not yeah, the whole to-do list. I, I imagine <laughs> that's a long list, but no, what is your I, priority? When I remember two years ago, after the first Martin Roth Symposium, what we thought about the next one, it's completely different. <laughs> well, it's changed, well, it's changed a lot, and we planned this symposium before um, Corona, no? Yeah. And now it changed a lot the form and how we organized it. Now it's, it's uh, quite difficult to say, but what I'm um, interested in is um, to, to, to see how... We spoke a lot about art museums, no? maybe about museums of, of um, natural history or, or so, but what um, does other, other kind of museums, how do they work? For example, the, the most visited museum in Stuttgart, it's not Kunstmuseum, it's not the Staatsgalerie, it's Mercedes-Benz Museum. And it's a quite good museum. Yeah. It's a museum of history about democracy and so on. The, the most um, visited museum, for example, in Barcelona, it's not Picasso, it's not Miro, it's Barça, the football club <laughs> <laughs> museum. And, and as well, so they, they, they show, it's not a museum of football only, it's a museum as well, um, let's say, about Catalonia about uh, the independent movement of Catalonia, because Barca, at least two years ago, were a declaration of independence, no? the football club. So to, to speak with those kinds of museum with uh, other narratives, that I think would be interesting. B maybe they, like Mercedes as well, they would agree completely that they have to work about democracy or about uh, history. No, it's not about cars, it's about how the, our, our awareness of what a state should be changed during the last 60, 70 years. No, that's in Mercedes-Benz. And that would be f interesting for me to, to speak with those kind of museums, private museums, public museums, but who has other objects. Yeah. So a lot of Zoom calls are coming up. <laughs> I hear that in times of a global pandemic. Thank you very much. This is your applause. Thank you for these insights. Thanks to Andreas Görgen, Marion Ackermann, Julia Grosse and Ronald Kretz. Thank you very much. Thank you.
And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a wrap. Thank you to all the speakers, to all the participants, to the organizing partners, of course, to the speakers, to the translators, to the whole team here in front of the camera, but also, of course, behind the lenses. Greetings from the Naturkunde für Berlin to you, dear audience, uh, geographically apart, but definitely connected throughout the world. I wish you all the best. See you soon. Thank you. <laughs>